It is really my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Kafwi Zirasa. Kaf is an associate professor at Duke University with appointments in the departments of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, neurobiology, biomedical engineering, and neurosurgery. His research interests focus on understanding how changes in the brain produce neurological and mental illness. Kafwi Zarasa completed a PhD in neurobiology at Duke University and obtained an MD from the Duke University School of Medicine in 2009. He completed his residency training in general psychiatry there in 2016. Kafwi is the recipient of numerous awards and recognition, some of which include the Charles Johnson Leadership Award, the One Mind Rising Star Award, the Sydney Bear Prize for Schizophrenia Research, the inaugural Duke Medical Alumni Emerging Leader Award, and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, PCAS, the nation's highest award for scientists and engineers in the early stages of their independent research careers. CAF was recognized as one of Ebony Magazine's 30 Young Leaders of the Future in February 2008. In 2017, he was recognized as 40 Under 40 in Health by the National Minority Quality Forum and the Engineering Alumni of the Year from UMBC. He was inducted into the American Society for Clinical Investigation in 2019. CAF has served as an associate scientific advisor for the journal Science Translational Medicine, a member of the congressionally mandated Next, Generated Research, Next Generation Research Initiative, the editorial board of TEDMED, and on the NIH Director's Guiding Committee for the Brain Initiative. He currently serves in the NIH Director's Next Track Advisory Committee and the Brain Initiative Multi-Council 2.0 Working Group. CAF's ultimate goal is to combine his research, his medical training, and his community experience to improve outcomes for a diverse communities suffering from neurological and psychiatric illness. Kaf, on a personal note, I've just been so impressed with your life story. I forget when was the first time we met. It, it might have been at the Stagland Vineyards for the One Mind Music Festival to raise funds for mental health research. I had the honor of visiting your lab at Duke, and I would say the greater honor of hosting you for a day at Enscopics. I also had the privilege of seeing you on an hour long panel with President Obama two months before the 2016 elections. It was quite the memorable panel. You're one of America's greatest minds in my opinion, a physician, a scientist, an advocate for diversity and inclusion. And yet you're humble and someone anyone would feel comfortable having a beer with. Kath, it is a real honor to have you kick off our segment on a better world. The virtual stage is yours. Well, well, thank you so much uh, for having me here uh, and to Inscopix for putting together this really important panel at this really important time as well. Um, one of the, uh, the the things you missed in that last section is I'm an engineer, so much, much in, in my uh, DNA. In addition and to all of the above. Th- <laughs> <laughs> and, and how I, I think about uh, science is from the background of an engineer. And I got into the area of mental health research, really thinking about how to take engineering tools and engineering principles and use them to uh, advance neuroscience and to come up with new treatments for mental health and ultimately to make the world a better place. When I was uh, getting into my graduate work, uh, it was the time we recently finished uh, decoding the human genome. So there was this huge, what was going to be this huge almost encyclopedia that gave us our understanding of how our genes produced illness, right? I'd learned about how there were genes for whether it was cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia, the the link between genes and disease. And the hope was that we would ultimately find that same sort of link in the space of mental illness, right? We would find the gene for schizophrenia, the gene for bipolar disorder. And we could use that understanding to come up with new treatments. As an engineer, I was interested in brain stimulation, uh, recording electrical activity in the brain in the same way that, you know, people record electrical activity in the heart, right? You get chest pain, the record electrical activity in your heart, and then we come up with new treatments. I thought we could do the same sort of thing with neuroscience and, and understanding how to come up with new treatments for mental illness. So my idea was we could take these genes for mental illness, put them in animal models, uh, in particular mice, figure out how that changed electricity in their brain, and then come up with new treatments for it. So I I went headlong into graduate school, really excited about the opportunity to do this. And while I was in graduate school, my my excitement about scientific inquiry became much more personal. Um, One of my family members went missing. Uh, We discovered him in an alleyway in another continent hallucinating. And that's when it became clear to me how deep uh, mental illness had impacted my own family, right? At this point in time, I was no longer an engineer. I was actually a family member. 
And I, I wanted to, it, as this became more personal, um, I, I went from, you know, working the standard graduate school student eight hours a day to 16 hours a day, really trying to put all of my energy and effort into not only helping to make the world a better place, but ultimately healing my family, which is a huge driver for many of us. And so I'll, I'll lead you into my talk. I'll share my screen now and start off uh, my presentation, which is called Translating Neuroscience. And for me, this idea of translating neuroscience is just about as much of making the world a better place as it is the idea of healing my own family. So as these genes for mental illness were being uncovered, um, it, it was pretty clear early on that there was like no single gene that gave rise for schizophrenia across all the in individuals that we saw. No single gene for bipolar disorder, uh, no single gene for depression. Rather, it was almost like a composite of genes. So imagine this is a pattern or an architecture of many genes that together gave rise for mental illness. This is a, a major study done um, in patients who had schizophrenia and what they found in this study, there were multiple gene loci. So they had hundreds of thousands of folks that had uh, the illness, hundreds of thousands of folks that didn't. And they would compare it and say, what's the difference in the genes, right? If you're looking at a simple disorder, a simple monogenic disorder, something like cystophrenic, uh, excuse me, cystic fibrosis, you might find one pattern here. They had a combination of 108 genes that together, um, somehow in a complex interaction, gave rise to schizophrenia. So this, this for me was a really exciting landmark. It meant Although there wasn't one gene, there were at least genetic targets that we can identify. But over, over time, I, I began to realize how, the difficulty and the challenges in studies like this. And sometimes it's lost as we as scientists are reading literature. Um, the real challenge is to prevent studies like this from being applied for stem study families like mine. And so you can, you can see here, it's just looking at genomic studies, uh, studies that looked at in human beings' whole genomic architecture. And the number of studies across time from 2000 to 2018. And you can see that most of our understanding of the genetics um, of mental illnesses, uh, of the genetics of, of illnesses, but mental illnesses as well, is based on individuals of European ancestry. In other words, individuals whose families were in Europe hundreds over the last few hundred years. And that has increased over time. So as you're looking at this complex pattern of eight, 108 genes, and you're asking about how well that separates or different in individuals who have mental illness and individuals that don't, um, individuals that have complex illnesses like heart disease, individuals that don't, you see a pattern that looks like this. In other words, the predictive patterns, the predictive genomic patterns apply really well uh, in individuals of European ancestry. They do worse in folks from South Asia, worse from folks from East Asia, and then they are substantially less predictive in folks of African ancestry. And as, as me as a scientist who's sitting here, my family's, uh, both my parents migrated here from West Africa. It was pretty clear that these genomic patterns that I was using to guide my basic science studies weren't necessarily genomic patterns that apply uh, to my family. Family. And so I was really challenged in this space, thinking about how I would do science in a way that was relevant for helping my loved ones as well. Uh, as I said, my background is I'm an engineer, so I'll explain a little a bit about this tool that we use in the lab. It's called machine learning or artificial intelligence. And what it does is it tries to take large complex data sets, things like the genome, and it finds patterns in them so it could separate out conditions. And so here's an example. I've just got a bunch of O's on there. And you might ask the machine to learn what is the pattern of symmetry in this group. And you'd send this into a complex set of algorithms, and you'd ultimately learn there's a clear pattern of symmetry across these six subjects, and you could find it repeatedly. Once you've learned this pattern of symmetry, you say, how predictive is it in a new group of subjects? So like any medical diagnostic, you'd say what you want it to do is do really well in predicting who's healthy and who's sick in a new patient that comes in the door, right? So you can learn the pattern in an original group of patients, but you want it to work in the new patient. So a new group of patient comes in, they're slightly different from the first group. And then you say, how well does that same pattern of symmetry that you learned in the first group work? And it works exceptionally well. And then you extend this a little bit further because you want this to work across a, a broad group of patients that may come in the door. Um, they're slightly different than the first two groups. Um, and then you say, well, how well does this pattern of symmetry work? Again, you test it and the pattern of symmetry works really well. So now you've done what's called learning the model and you show that the model generalizes to a new group of subjects. Now, ideally, what you'd like to do is take a new group of complex interactions of these subjects. So it's a mixed group. Make sure the pattern of symmetry works. And again, it works. And then finally extend this out to the rest of your population and make sure this pattern of symmetry works again. 
And in this case, we have a new group of subjects. We test the pattern of symmetry and the pattern of symmetry fails, right? So even though it worked for these new groups of subjects, because those are the ones we use to learn the line, it fails to what we call extrapolate to a new group of subjects. Now, what you'd ideally like to do is have a learning or a training set that includes all of the patients and folks of all kinds of backgrounds in your learning set. And what you may ultimately learn in that case is that there's a better line of symmetry. So here we've discovered a new line of symmetry that wasn't discovered in the first case because we didn't include the Ws in the training set. And when you do that, now you have a, a line of symmetry or diagnostic that extrapolates to everybody. And this is the real challenge when we talk about these genomic data sets. Um, and the fact that they don't include everybody of every background, that the, the knowledge base that we learn from them may not be the ultimate or optimal line of symmetry. So uh, um, I, I'll make this a little more tangible uh, for all of the animal researchers out there as well. Like I said, I'm an engineer. I spend most of my time uh, working with mice in the lab. And I have borrowed this slide from a colleague of mine at Caltech, Viviana Gradinaru. And what she's doing in this case is working on a study that's particularly relevant for how we may think about treating mental illness in the end. And what she's trying to do now here is, as, we, as you've probably heard throughout the day, the brain is a really difficult organ to study and understand because it's hard, because we have skulls. <laughs> and so it's hard to access the tissue of interest. And so what she's working on in her group is figuring out how to get genes or proteins of interest into the brain without needing go, to go through the skull. So she's worked on developing uh, viral compounds that essentially cross the blood-brain barrier. In other words, you can put these viruses into uh, a vein. Those viruses will cross the blood-brain barrier. And then we can try to use that technology to get genes or proteins turned on in specific cells in the brain as a way of treating mental illness. Now, Here's, I have here four mouse strains. Uh, this is like the, the example I showed you at the beginnings with the O and the W and, and making sure that the technology applies broadly. And what I'm showing you on the bottom is a fluorescent protein. It just creates a green color if the virus crosses the blood-brain barrier and expresses in brain cells. And I think it's really important to note here that these are all mice. <laughs> there are four strains of mice that are used widely in research labs. They are all mice. They will breed with each other. They will produce more mice. But when you try with this viral protein, to cross the blood-brain barrier, it works way better in one strain of mouse, the black six mouse, than it does in the other lines of mice. So in fact, if you were to generate a tool or technology that you would use to turn specific brain cells, make them more or less active, it would only work in one of the strains of mice. And having realized this and thought about this early on, what she did in the lab was create a viral construct that worked for multiple strains of mice. So this initial, this initial decision that she made to test this across multiple strains of mouse um, led to a better technology that would work for all of the mice. And, and I'll raise this as an important point because as we're thinking about the genetics um, and accessing brain cells to treat mental illness, it's going to be really important for us to make sure that we've included all of the human ancestries involved as we're developing these technologies as well. Um, and so this, this brings me to, I've got a couple more slides, um, just to make this more tangible for everybody. And I think this is a really important imperative uh, that was raised by the critical work being done in my colleague's lab. And for many folks, they, they actually don't realize that we're in a, a quest, an accelerated quest, to understand how the human brain works. So launched in 2013 under the Obama administration was the Brain Initiative. And the goal of the Brain Initiative was to generate new tools and new technologies to understand how the human brain works such that we can create new treatments for illnesses like Alzheimer's or autism, depression, bipolar disorder, um, using these new technologies. And one of the key points of developing these new technology is to essentially understand what it means to have 200 billion cells in your brain and what makes them uniquely different. And if we can figure out how to get genes expressed or proteins to different cells in the brain, and we know what the catalog or the encyclopedia of those brain cells are, then we can combine those two technologies together to figure out how to better treat mental illness. And so one of the big advances that we're trying to, to, to take on now in this area of the brain initiative is to understand the catalog of all of those cells cells in the brain. Understand what makes those 200 billion cells different. Imagine this is the challenge of doing the human genome, but doing the genome genome 
200 billion times for each individual brain and understanding what is important and what is uh, unique about those brain cells. And this is a really amazing study that was done uh, recently. What they've done is they're looking at the genomic or genetic architecture of cells um, in a part of the brain, uh, but they're looking both in a mouse, um, in a monkey, and in a human, and they're trying to figure out if there's a common genomic or genetic signature across these different brains, across species. And as I mentioned, you can imagine taking something like Viviana's or Dr. Brandonaru's technology to target, um, to get viruses across uh, the blood-brain barrier, and then figuring out how to get them to different brain cell types or brain regions. And here, um, as they've noted, they have two males, two females of across age ranges, but what's going to be really important, as I showed you in the slide and I told you, I showed you in the case of the genomic landscape, is understanding whether there are differences across ancestry. And for all of the neuroscientists or neurologists or family members out there, you can imagine how tragic it would be if we developed a fantastic technology, which in the case of depression, caused your area of brain called prefrontal cortex, our subgenual singular cortex, which is involved in, in depression, and we could figure out how to tune activity in that area in the case of depression, but as soon as you go to a different ancestry, those same that same technology, instead of targeting prefrontal cortex, targets hippocampus and you end up with seizures. And we don't want to get to the point of doing this in humans before we decide that we, we discover that there are really important differences in ancestry. So here, to make the case, it's really important as we're developing this catalog of brain cells to definitely study if there are differences across ancestry the same way there is across the genomic architecture as well, as we've been advancing the precision medicine initiative more generally. All right. So I, I, I'll leave you with, with this thought. Um, I, I've been thinking a, a lot about this um, with all of the challenges, the social unrest, um, how we as um, scientists have been really exploring and a society have been exploring the challenges around systemic racism. And I, I, as I, I put this slide up, um, you know, my hope is it would drive some level of discomfort. Um, and, and I'd ask you to just for a second, think about the discomfort that you're feeling, right? Some, some people may feel uh, hatred or anger. Some people may feel sadness or racism. Um, we might think about dark periods of history. But, but I'll tell you, uh, the thought I had when I saw this as an engineer is it's what happens when we selectively apply technology and development to one group uh, and we forget about the other one. What I see when I look at this picture is this, the same sort of challenge of when we're selectively applying technology only to a segment of the world population. In this case, 16% of the world population, uh, which has ancestry in Europe. So what I've been working on, it's a project that joined uh, several, several months ago. It's actually a community-based project that was founded and led uh, by Dr. Alvin Hathaway, Dr. Al Hathaway, who's a pastor in uh, Baltimore. And he got together with uh, Eddie Brown, who is an entrepreneur and social philanthropist, and with uh, Daniel Weinberger, who's the CEO of uh, the Lieber Institute, which is uh, right there on Johns Hopkins campus, and the provost of Morgan State. And what they wanted to do was close some of this gap that we're talking about in understanding brains um, of folks of African ancestry. And they've launched what is called the African Ancestry Neuroscience Research Initiative, for which I am uh, on the scientific advisory board. And what they're seeking to do is for the first time generate an encyclopedia or compendium of what are the differences in gene expression uh, in the brain of folks from African ancestry, both to apply technology to bring this group up to speed where our understanding is of folks of European ancestry, but also we hope that it might also help us discover things, differences in, uh, uh, in biology between the ancestries that may ultimately improve the health and well-being of all of us. So, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been an incredibly challenging year as a scientist, um, as a human being, uh, as a family member as well. But I think there's a lot of hope of where we can take all of these challenges that we, 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 we face directly as a society to making things better uh, for all of us. So I'm grateful to be here. I thank you all for listening to my story. I'm hopeful ultimately that this work and this effort will make things better uh, for your family and for mine as well. So thank you all for having me here.
Thank you so much, Kaf. Um, what, what an amazing journey um, that you yourself have, have led and what an amazing project the African Ancestral Research Initiative is. Um, one of the questions from the, um, the audience was actually um, specific to, to this. Um, how can um, individuals, corporations, not-for-profits support the African Ancestry Initiative? Yeah, so that that is a wonderful question. Um, it, it's a question that that makes me <laughs> me smile, right? I, I I always say, right, as as a scientist, uh, passion um, and energy and hard work is critically important, but uh, financial support makes things go faster. And as we're talking about Ill- mental illness, we all realize how critically important it is for things to move faster, right? There's so much suffering um, in our worlds and in our community. So you can, it's easy. You can reach out to me um, at Duke University, Kafui dot jirasa at duke.edu. Um, send me a note. I'd be happy to conv- connect you with uh, the organizers and the heads, both uh, Reverend Hathaway and da- Dr. Daniel Weinberger, so we can figure out how to accelerate this and make things go faster. We're actively working on developing partnerships with brain donation centers. One of the areas that we think is critically important, I've talked um, in, in, in my other, <laughs> some other spaces, about the importance of having scientists um, who uh, reflect the communities that are sometimes has been left behind in our areas of development. So the reason why that connection uh, and the provost at Morgan State uh, is playing such an important role is because we're simultaneously thinking about training as well. So how can we use the initiative to both train the next generation of scientists um, and the next generation of doctors as well as we seek to advance this um, forward? So please reach out to me and I am happy to connect you um, to the leadership of the initiative such that we can figure out how to move things along much faster. Great, thank you. Um, another question that I had actually that you know relates back to um, a general point you made about inclusion um, as we think about science and and also clinical trials um, and the fact that you know a lot of our understanding today with respect to um, behavioral disorders and um, the potential of therapeutics is is based on a you know a biased sample set and you know that. Um, obviously leads to potentially erroneous um, results and you know lack, lack of efficacy in, in large populations that are not represented in that sample set. So, so a question that I had, Kaf, is how do we get you know the broad ecosystem, pharma, others to be more inclusive in their clinical trials? You know, how do we make clinical trials more representative of the population in the U.S. or, or globally? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's an ethical imperative to, to decide that it is the right thing to do, right? Um, it is the right thing to do to make medicines that work for everybody. I think COVID-19 has really exposed the gap here, right, um, that we have, particularly in the United States of America, um, both regard to, whether it's regards to diabetes or housing conditions, right, things that make um, illness substantially worse. So the first is to recognize that there's an ethical imperative, right? This is our imperative as, as, <laughs> as those in the healthcare industry industry to do this, right? Secondly, is both to, is also to recognize that there's a history here, right? Um, the African, as I was um, learning about the African Ancestry uh, Research Initiative, I was actually sitting at Hopkins. <laughs> and my, my first thought as I was sitting there and they were telling me about this was, so you're really going to ask Black people to give you their brains, <laughs> right? Because I was sitting there having realized that, you know, Henrietta Lacks, her cells uh, were cultured and taken like in the building next door, right? And these cells, uh, that we're taking were used to develop uh, the HeLa cell line, which has been a tremendous uh, boon for the biomedical research community in advancing cures and treatments um, in, in our understanding of cancer. Um, in, in, in fact, to that effect, um, I would even say major medical institutes, um, HHMI, Howard Hughes, recently decided that they were going to help support Henry L. Lacks's family um, in terms of their foundation and well-being as well. So I think one has to acknowledge that there's a history of wrongdoing that's been done um, and that is the imperative of our field in our industry to go further in correcting that, right? So one cannot simply put up a flyer on the wall and say we want, you know, research subjects and assume that whoever came in the door, it is, that's that's what the patient population should look mm-hmm. like, right? An additional step must be taken to correct those historical inequities um, because it is the moral imperative to make health accessible for all. 
Yeah, no, that's absolutely um, compelling, compelling point. And I think we could we could probably go on quite a bit speaking about these issues. I'll, I'll take one last question from the audience here in the interest of time. Um, and I think it's, it's a very personal question from perhaps uh, um, a young neuroscientist, um, you know, who is concerned about um, his or her career and speaking up about systemic racism. And, and the question is this, that Kaf, what advice do you have for young, young neuroscientists who are facing systemic racism in academia on how to speak up while preserving their paths to success? Yeah, so I, I'll say I'll say a couple of things, right? I mean, we are in a democracy, which means every voice matters, right? Um, but one single vote by itself does not outweigh 140 million other votes, right? So it's really important um, that when these movements happen, that they, that one learns how to build relationships and networks in order to do this, right? My success as a neuroscientist is based on amazing, good men and women who early on decided to invest in me and decided to support um, and nurture my voice. So when I speak, it's never just me speaking, right? It is me speaking with mentors and advocates, people that I can call on the phone and say I'm having a bad day. Um, there's not a single story that I could tell now about my experience as a neuroscientist that my mentors um, and those that support me didn't hear 10 years ago. And in many cases, um, in the vast majority of those cases, those mentors don't look like me. Right. Um, some of which you've seen uh, today. I can see Tom on 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 the screen with me. Right. But it, it's individuals who don't look like me and don't have a hundred percent of the same shared experiences who are connected with the values of what I'm talking about. Those values of equity. Those values of making a difference. And those the American value of finding talent and creating spaces where the best talent can always rise. So I say find mentors. Um, and advocates and supports and allies to amplify uh, the issues that we see and experience. Thank you so much, Kaf. Powerful, powerful messages for, for us all to, to take away. It really was an honor to have you here today. Thank you so much. <laughs>